Um, are we good to go? Good, good. Um, my very sincere apologies again for those who haven't heard me say this already. Um, always the best laid plans with technology find a way of getting messed up. So I really am glad that y'all could make it. Um, glad also that, you know, with all of the really challenging health and economic questions that are happening in the world that y'all have taken time to be on this call um, and to, to think about appropriations with us and the funding that um, we, we are going to be asking for um, outside of the coronavirus epidemic. Um, so my name is Sanaz Arjumant. I'm the Federal Policy Director at the National Young Farmers Coalition. Uh, Karen Gardner, our Pennsylvania manager, is also here and is helping with housekeeping um, and checking questions. And Karen, I welcome any sort of answers to questions that you might want to share also. So um, as I said before, this is uh, being recorded for folks who can't join. Um, but we're just going to ask that folks stay on mute. Um, if you have a question during the presentation, um, I have just a couple slides that I'll go through pretty quickly. Um, if you could just type those into the chat box. Um, I'll try to pause also if you're not, you know, using a computer and can't chat easily. Um, I will try to pause after certain sections to ask questions as well. Um, and then hopefully there will still be a bunch of time at the end to take overall questions. And if we want to go into, you know, non-appropriation subjects, I'm also happy to stay on a bit later and answer those questions. Um, so with all that being said, um, hopefully everybody can see the shared screen. I put just a couple of slides together for us to go through. Um, so I'm going to start clicking through those now. What I really was hoping that we would be able to do together tonight is just go over the appropriations process in really plain language talk about some of the things that we are hoping to get funding for this year, share a little bit about where we are in the process and talk about how you can get involved or stay involved if you've already worked on appropriations with us. Um, but before I dive into all that, just to really underline this whole thing, um, it gets technical, and um, it can seem really boring, but really why we care is that we are directing our resources towards the kind of system that we want. And Young Farmers has a track record of being pretty successful in the things that we advocate for with our partners. So I just thought um, I would share some of the things that we count as wins that we saw um, this money is going out the door in fiscal year 20, which is the year that we're in right now. So. This year we saw $10 million for farmer, farmer mental health in the Farmer and Rancher Stress Assistance Network program. And that program hadn't been funded before this year. Millions of dollars going towards urban agriculture, towards supporting farmers of color as they work through heirs property issues and maintain ownership of their land. And mil millions of more dollars going towards training, um, beginning in socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. So um, it's really, really important that we express to our members of Congress where we want to see our dollars go and put our money where our mouth is when it comes to building a more sustainable and equitable food system. So I'll go into the process a little bit now. Um, I wanted to start with some, a, a little bit of jargon that's hard to avoid in the DC world um, and separate these two terminal, uh, these two uh, words that kind of get used interchangeably, um, but have a little bit different meanings. So when we're thinking about the budgeting process, I think when you and I are thinking about our personal budget, it sort of encompasses everything of figuring out how much money we have, how much money we're spending, where we're spending it. That gets sort of broken up in federal policy language to talk about setting the top line numbers, how much do we have to spend overall. That is the budgeting process. 
when we are talking about how much money goes into specific programs, for example, some of the things I mentioned before, like how much money the Farmer and Rancher Stress Assistance Network is going to get, that is set through the appropriations process. And that is a process that happens every year, once a year. Another couple of terms that I thought would be important to go over, um, another big piece of legislation that you've probably heard of us working on is the farm bill. And there is a lot of money that gets decided in the farm bill. And that money is called mandatory funding. So that's a sort of a separate process. It happens once every five years or so. Um, and the money that is in that bill more or less is settled. Um, and those programs that get that funding, that's called mandatory funding. There's another type of funding that's called discretionary funding. Um, and these are separate from farm bill programs. So sometimes the farm bill will say, this program should exist, but we're not gonna put any money in it here. So that would be a discretionarily funded program, and then we'd have to work through appropriations to get extra money for that. So um, the mandatory funding, a lot of the conservation programs, some of the bigger sort of commodity supplemental nutrition assistance programs, those are set. Some of the smaller programs are usually the ones that need extra funding through the appropriations process. So I'll just pause there um, to see if there's anybody who's on the phone who wants to unmute and ask a question before I move on further. Okay, good. Looks good. So the process sort of like any other bill process. It's got a couple of different steps to it. Um, so I've laid it out in this flow chart here. What's not shown sort of at the beginning is what I mentioned, the budgeting process that happens where we're laying out overall, how much money are we gonna spend? So the budget committee, the folks that figure all that out, send that to the House and Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, each side is going to be setting their funding numbers for the subcommittees that they work on. And when we're talking about appropriation subcommittees, mostly in the agricultural world, um, that's the, they, it handles agriculture, rural development, and the Food and Drug Administration. So that's the subcommittee handling all those issues and then education, interior, environment, those have other, um, other subcommittees that are doing this process simultaneously. There are 12 um, total. So each of the subcommittees takes feedback from their members. Um, they write the bill that, again, puts money towards specific programs. Uh, they debate the bills, they pass the bills, the appropriations committee passes the bills. And then like any other bills, those go to the floor and they're passed on the House and Senate. Um, once they are passed on both sides, there are usually some pretty big differences to be ironed out. So there would be a conference committee that's going to reconcile any differences between the two options. Then the bills have to go back out and be passed on both the House and Senate floor again, and then they're sent to the president to be signed into law. So more or less the same process as um, any sort of regular bill, but it's happening simultaneously through the different subcommittees um, for these 12 different issue areas. So I'll pause there again, just in case anybody needs to come off of mute and ask a question. Can I, ask, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, can you explain the Appropriations Committee setting the subcommittee funding numbers again? Sure. So there are um, there are allocations that are made for each of the subcommittees. Um, it's called the 302A process, but basically they would just say, okay, 
we've gotten our budget. We know how much is going to be spent overall. Here is how much you have subcommittee on agriculture, rural development, and uh, Food and Drug Administration to spend on your programs. Now you figure out how to spend that among, how to divide that among all the programs that you have to fund. Does that make more sense? Thanks for the question, Karen. Okay, great. Well, I will keep on keeping on. Um, in theory, there is a timeline for how this happens. It happens every year. Um, and uh, the fiscal year, it runs from October 1st to September 30th. So we're in fiscal year 20, talking about fiscal year 2021. Um, and we know that this process doesn't always go according to plan because, you know, we have had, we've very recently all lived through a shutdown. Um, so this is a loose guide to how this process should be working. Um, just sort of for reference of where we are in this process. The first thing is that the president submits a budget to Congress, and that has already happened in early February. Uh, regardless of which administration it is and how the party's um, power is split between the presidency and the legislative branch, the president's budget is generally um, a political document. It is something that um, it just shows their priorities for the coming year, not something that Congress really has to adhere to in any way. There's a saying in DC that the president proposes and Congress disposes of the president's budget. So they sort of draw their line in the sand um, from the administration that kicks off the process. And that again has happened uh, in early February. Uh, in mid-April, in theory, by mid-April, Congress is supposed to have a budget resolution that sets top line numbers for spending. This happens in kind of an unusual way. So even though we're not past April 15th, um, we had a two-year budget deal uh, in 2019. And so we do have some budget numbers actually set for 2020. Uh, then sometime in mid-May, the House starts working on the bills in committees. So they've gathered feedback from members about what their priorities should be. Um, and they start sort of trying to hammer that out. And because spending bills have to originate in the House, the rules have laid out specifically that the House goes first. Although, um, you know, it's happening sort of at the same time. Uh, in theory, by the end of June, all the bills should be passed. They're figure, they've figured out the differences between the House and the Senate. It's ready to go for a signature. And then the fiscal year starts with a budget in place. Um, a lot of this timeline is flexible. And um, if in some cases uh, we don't adhere to it and the fiscal year starts without a budget, um, as I mentioned before, that can end in a, a shutdown until Congress can figure out the spending and appropriations, um, or it can be something called a continuing resolution where they'll just say, okay, we'll just keep our numbers from last year. Like we'll just fund at the exact same levels until we can figure out what comes next. So I'll pause there again briefly in case anyone on the phone has a question. Great. A uh, big question mark about what this timeline looks like now. Um, we had been going really at a pretty quick pace um, and pretty near, pretty nearly sticking to the timeline that I had shared um, before really the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, necessitated Congress uh, leaving DC and they are working from home and on a recess and trying to figure it out. But a lot of the parts of this process, like holding hearings, doing meetings with the agency heads, um, 
is sort of up in the air how that will proceed. And honestly, the timeline is a bit um, up in the air as well because there have been such big spending bills that have passed already. Um, so we may not exactly stick to that timeline again this year that was shared um, in the previous slide, I think. Um, members of Congress and leadership on the budget and appropriations committees are trying to figure out exactly what kind of timeline they might be able to adhere to for this year's appropriations. So I've mentioned this before, but just to um, sort of re-highlight the point that um, the House and Senate budget committees are setting those big picture numbers, and then it's up to the House and Senate appropriations committees um, and specifically the agriculture appropriations subcommittees to really think about how the money is being spent in these different programs that we think are important. So I pulled this from Wikipedia um, just to give you all an idea of the um, membership of these different committees. So you can see on the top the House Ag Appropriations Subcommittee and on the bottom the Senate Ag Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, when it says chair, that is the majority party leadership, the highest ranking person in the uh, committee or subcommittee in this case. And so that's a person that has a lot of decision making power. And ranking member is just the term for the minority party's sort of leadership person in the subcommittee. So if any of these people that you see on the screen are your member of Congress, you are in a really good position to work on appropriations work with us or for other issues that you care about. If your member of Congress is not on this um, Ag Approach subcommittee, could still be on appropriations, worth checking it out. And you know, every member of Congress, again, has the opportunity to share with the committee what their priorities are. So don't let this stop you, but just noting that um, there you might have an extra good opportunity to do appropriations work if you are any of, in any of these states or districts. So I'll pause there. That was all I was going to share about the process. So if there was anything that wasn't clear that folks want to go over, I'm happy to do that now. Um, otherwise, I will shift into talking about what Young Farmers is advocating for this time around. Okay. Hey, this is Chris Ostrander from Washington State, and yes. I have a question about that. So, uh, so uh, and Washington doesn't have anybody on the Ag Appropriations Subcommittees, but is it okay if there's an issue that needs to be weighed in on to contact your own Congress people and ask them to relay your information to uh, Ag Appropriations? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question and I'm glad for the chance to clarify. So um, in the process slide that I had before, um, we talked about the Ag Appropriations Committee, um, or subcommittee rather, uh, coming up with their bill, drafting it. And that's happening across all the different subcommittees. Uh, but they definitely don't do that in a vacuum. And all members of Congress have the chance to submit their priorities to the committee sort of formally in writing. There's a whole electronic system that they use to send their priorities. So early in the process, it's definitely a great idea to let your member of Congress know this program is really important to us and we'd like you to include it in your priorities in reaching out to the Appropriations Committee. And then further in the process, definitely those bills are going to be voted on by the full chamber, House or Senate. So there's another opportunity for your member of Congress to give input, make an amendment, you know, work on it once it's to the floor. And they could also be friendly with um, others. Uh, members of Congress who are on the committees and share that information or just, you know, outside of the sort of formal touch points where they are, have to be part of the process, you, they can definitely get 
involved um, and share their priorities too. So um, you have a little bit of a leg up if your member is already working on ag appropriations, but absolutely it doesn't preclude you from asking or like telling your member of Congress what's really important to you because all members are, are involved. Any other questions that I can answer before we move on? And you can feel free to chat into the chat box too, um, if you prefer to do that rather than unmuting. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch gears now to talk about the things that we have been advocating for with National Young Farmers Coalition so that you know some of the programs um, that we have been talking about. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions uh, about these as well. So the first thing that we have been talking about is called the TOTAL survey. TOTAL stands for the Tenure, Ownership, and Transition of Agricultural Land Survey. Uh, attached to the survey, there's also a land report. So you've probably um, heard past um, advocacy too from the young farmers about a land report um, that will use this data to sort of understand the trends in farmland ownership, barriers to entry, viability um, of uh, young farmers and ranchers. And a new addition to this survey is that they're also going to be um, looking at the prevalence of heirs property on farmland. Um, and I, I sort of referred to this earlier, it'll come up again in some other slides, but heirs property is a situation that occurs when a piece of land is passed down from one generation to the next without a formal will. And then that land is held by all of the relatives for generations and that can make um, maintaining legal ownership really a challenge and it means that the people who have heirs property are um, really susceptible to land loss and this is mostly a challenge with black farmers and ranchers in the southeast is where this is really really prevalent and has led to um, a lot of black land loss in the southeast so we don't actually have data about how much heirs property there is in the country, what sort of resources it would need to help those farmers address those legal challenges. Um, so that's an important addition to the survey this time around. Um, and this survey is also important because it's not just looking at farmers and ranchers, it's looking at the people who own land. And that can be people who have never farmed before and are investing or are a couple generations removed from when their family was operating the farm. And it, in the survey, um, those non-operating landowners are sharing what their plans are with, to do with their land for the next five years down the road. So recognizing that land access is a really, really major challenge for a lot of folks in our network. Uh, we really want to see the funding go towards the total survey so we can have an idea of how much land is being transferred and why it is or isn't being transferred to certain people. And the cost for that each year is $3 million. So that's our ask for fiscal year 21. It would be the first year that this survey has received funding. The next thing that we've been talking about is conservation operations. Um, if you have ever had um, in safer times, natural resources conservation service staff out to your farm or ranch to help you with a conservation plan or with putting into place a new conservation practice, uh, the salary for those staff to be able to do that largely comes from conservation operations. And their request for this year is 840 million. Um, we are shooting our shot, so to speak. Uh, it's an increase from last year's funding, but we recognize that with climate change and all of the challenges that the changing um, weather patterns and climate are bringing on farms and ranches and all of the opportunities for farmers to be able to sequester carbon and be a part of that solution that 
having USDA staff to be able to really assist with that is, is super important. So we're, we're hopeful that we'll see a, some increase in funding there this year. The next program that we have been talking about is the National Organic Program. They are the folks that manage organic certifiers and support the Organic Standards Board. Um, so this is really about maintaining the integrity of the organic seal. Um, it's a tool that um, a fair number of farmers in our network are using to help, um, you know, uh, solidify their businesses and also to just do right by the environment. And um, as more and more folks are getting into the organic program, again, important that um, the funding keep up with that. So this is, again, 20 million members, a little bit of an increase from uh, last year. Another program that we have been talking about is the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. This program is one of the ones that was okayed in the Farm Bill. It's written into law there, um, but doesn't have any money attached to it. So um, it helps urban rooftop um, and other innovative types of production farmers um, sort of get into the USDA system better, get farm numbers, be able to receive competitive grants, um, and receive um, advice from the uh, advisory committee. So this was one of the wins from last year. We, uh, in partnership with lots of other organizations, were able to secure $5 million for its first year. We're aiming for $6 million this year. This next program, the Heirs Property Relending Program, is similarly one that was started in this last Farm Bill, but doesn't have any funding attached to it. So I've already defined um, Heirs Property, but this program would provide grants to organizations that have a strong history of working with, organiz uh, with farmers of color, and um, they would provide legal services to um, clear ownership and title of that land and help maintain uh, land ownership by farmers of color. So um, this was funded at $5 million last year. We're hoping that it gets funded at $5 million again. Um, interestingly, this is one of the few programs that we've been advocating for that was included in the administration's budget. budget. So in that presidential budget, um, this was funded at Three million. So we do feel like there's a good um, a good chance that we'll see this funding again in the end. And the last program that I wanted to talk about is called the Farming Opportunities Training and Outreach Program. This again is a grant making program, um, and organizations can use it to provide training to beginning farmers and ranchers or to socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers and veteran farmers and ranchers that sort of split into two categories. So this program has some money set in the farm bill already. It's not as much as past years. So there is also authorization for some appropriations. Um, so this five million is sort of an extra to get us back to historic levels of funding. So I'll pause there. Um, I didn't pause after each program, but if anybody wants to ask a question about our, any of our priorities, I'm happy to answer that now. Okay, great. So here's the exciting part. Um, the ways that you can help us advocate for these programs. Um, I've amended the timeline here a little bit so that you can see sort of the steps that we have in the process um, and some opportunities that we have coming up to um, continue to move our priorities along. So I mentioned it earlier and in response to Chris's questions that Different offices have um, submission forms so that you can formally on paper give requests and National Young Farmers Coalition has been sharing requests with Hill offices. Um, those, most of those deadlines have passed now, but that's something for these priorities that we have been doing. Um, the next step in the process is that the different subcommittees are going to be uh, working to get these priorities into bills. 
So it's still a great time to reach out to your member of Congress and talk about how important each, any of these programs are um, and make sure that that's included sort of in the first draft subcommittee level. Um, if it's not included in the subcommittee level and you've built up a good relationship with your member of Congress and they know why this program is important, um, then there's the opportunity to work with them to add an amendment, maybe to include funding for a program that got left out. And that same process will happen again as this is voted on on the full House and the full Senate, um, that there will be the opportunities to go in um, and submit amendments um, if something doesn't get in. Um, and I guess I'll just, I'll note too that in the process where um, the House and Senate are working out the differences between them, that's another real prime opportunity to say to your Senator, oh, we really want the House level for this program or vice versa. So sometimes those differences can sort of work in your favor. You know, even if you get funding in one bill and not the other, there's an opportunity to influence the process. Um, as, as the conference committee is ironing out those differences. So we've got an action that is geared up um, and ready to go for you. Um, you should be getting an email from Eventbrite with the link to this, um, and I'll include the link too in the chat. But one of our supporters, um, Senator Tina Smith from Minnesota, is sending around a dear colleague letter to the Senate and a dear colleague is just a way for senators to join together on a certain issue. It's a sign on letter um, where they will say that they think any certain given issue is important. And Tina, Tina Smith has sent one around to her Senate colleagues asking that they support that extra $5 million for the Farming Opportunities Training out and Outreach Program. So now is a great time to reach out to your senators and to ask them to sign on to this to your colleague, to go on the record um, and support this extra funding that goes towards training, beginning socially disadvantaged and veteran farmers. Um, this uh, webinar has gotten pushed back a little bit because of the COVID pandemic. And so this is a tight deadline, but it's a great, opportunity to just jump right in and do a little advocacy. So the deadline for Senate offices to sign in is tomorrow, April 2nd. And um, we will get that template out to you. Um, again, I'll put it in the chat box and um, the deadline for signing on is April 2nd tomorrow. Sanas, there's a question in the chat box from mm -hmm. star she says tina is one of my senators is it helpful to write to her and say thank you yes and is it worthwhile absolutely. to pester our other senator <laughs> <laughs> good question yes <laughs> yeah thank you for those questions star definitely it is always a good idea to say thank you that's advice that we give you know whether it's just a generic thank you for supporting young farmers in general when you're meeting somebody or really specific um, thank you for sending this dear colleague and showing your support that makes a huge difference and um, it makes it much easier to get this kind of um, uh, effort going in years future definitely um, there are a couple of other senators that have already signed on to this as well, which I'll just list off really quickly um, in case folks are on the phone. Um, let me just pull it up one second. Um, so besides Senator Smith, Senators Booker, Gillibrand, Brown, Jones, Bennett, Duckworth, Feinstein, Murphy, and Casey have signed on so far. Sadly, no uh, Republican support on this dear colleague letter yet, but they're still tomorrow. So um, hopefully uh, we can change a few minds and we've been talking about it here in DC too. Um, and so if your Senator was one of those that was 
listed and you'd like to drop them a thank you email, um, that would also be wonderful to do. Any other questions that folks have? Great. Star had also asked if it's worthwhile to pester her other senator um, or their other senator. I'm guessing the answer is yes. Yes, yes, um, definitely it is. Um, it's not pestering exactly. I think you should feel totally um, confident in going and asking for a really important piece of legislation. We super appreciate the efforts that you put in there. Um, <laughs> good, Star is a confident pesterer, but, um, but yeah, don't feel like you are bothering anyone by any means if they haven't gotten on. It's, it's still really um, helpful to ask. Um, your and, senator works for you and you're telling them how to do their job, right? <laughs> yeah. So the, the email and the link is sort of a form uh, that you can use and that will automatically, once you put your address in, it will go out to your senators. Um, if you have a relationship already with your senator and you just want to send an email or make a phone call, um, that is totally great as well. Um, the only sort of, you know, I think in, in normal circumstances, we would definitely encourage phone calls, just recognizing that a lot of um, people are working from home. So you may end up leaving a voicemail. And so we decided this time to go with the, the um, just a form e email. But again, if you have other contacts and want to help us out with this, uh, we would super appreciate that uh, with any of your senators. So a couple of things moving on. We've talked about some of the points in the process when um, you can get involved. These are just a couple of other ideas. Um, if you wanna get more active in federal policy, it's a great idea to get to know your member of Congress and to get to know their staff nearby you in their field offices. Um, they might be hosting teletown halls. Um, they might have an agricultural advisory group. If they work a lot on agricultural issues, sometimes they'll get a group of farmers together and you know, when they have a question about what should we do on XYZ issue, they'll reach out to that group. Um, so definitely worth asking about that. Um, normally we would say that it's a good time to, in April, to do a farm tour where while Congress is working from their home offices. Um, and I think, you know, in the long run, again, that would be a really great way to get to know your member of Congress. But in the meantime, um, you might be able to just offer to do a virtual farm tour and sort of a get to know you um, meeting so that they understand the challenges that you face on the farm and they get to see that firsthand. Um, if you'd like to keep up with the federal policy team, you can get our advocacy alerts and there's a number that you can text to um, or you can sign up on our website. And if you have experience with any of these programs or there's a federal policy issue that we're working on, um, even outside of appropriations and you wanna sort of share what your experiences have, have been, that's always helpful for us to be able to go into an office and say, our member from your district is feeling this situation in such and such a way and this policy would be really helpful in addressing that um, and you know sometimes we might be able to direct also press inquiries when people want to hear really how these different policies are impacting farmers for us to know that we can contact you is, is a great big help so that was all that I had planned out. I'm sorry that we've gone a little bit later than I had um, intended to but um, before we switched over to questions, but I am happy to take any other questions that people have, any comments, um, any other sort of feedback that you wanna share. Okay, well, hearing none, I'm just going to take that as a sign that this was all very clear. Um, if I 
if I wasn't clear and you want to get in touch, you can email me. Again, my name is Sanaz, um, uh, just at youngfarmers.org. Um, keep in touch with us by using that text to get our advocacy alerts and uh, keep an eye out for our federal policy setting process. Um, I see a, a question came in the chat box about um, the slides being available. We've been recording this session, um, so we will make that recording available. And um, thank you all so much for joining. Again, my apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, we hope that you take action, reach out to your senators tomorrow, and stay in touch with us as we keep advocating for funding for young farmer programs.